Uh, I'm Orsha Yaputz, uh, one of the organizers of the Hungarian NLP meetup and your host today. Actually, I'm a cognitive linguist and work as a researcher at Crown Intelligence, which is a boutique company, boutique consultancy specialized for NLP and data science, but so much about myself. And now let's turn to the topic. Uh, today, David Talby presents his ideas about Spark NLP. Uh, David is a Chief Technology Officer at John Snow Labs. Previously, he was with Microsoft and Amazon as well. He holds uh, a PhD in Computer Science and Master's uh, degrees in both Computer Science and Business and, uh, Administration. Before giving the floor to David, let's see some practical details of this event. Uh, the talk is recorded and uh, will be available on our YouTube channel, so on the YouTube channel of the Hungarian NLP Meetup next week. During the presentation, uh, which approximately lasts for 45 or 50 minutes, your mics uh, are muted. But you can, of course, raise questions and you should raise questions <laughs> via chat and I will ask them at the end of the talk. And uh, we will roughly have between 15, 10 and 15 minutes for this question and answer section. So if you are all ready, I wish to ask uh, you, David, uh, to start your presentation. Okay, David, can you start it now? Uh, yes. Okay. Am I uh, am I muted? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, David. Oh, so you can hear me. The okay. Stage, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. So you can hear me. Can you see the entire screen? Uh, Ursula. Okay, got it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Now I can see the chat. Okay, so let's begin. So uh, uh, this talk is about uh, Spark NLP. And thank you for the patience with all the, the, the setup and the issues we've had. Uh, it's an open source project. Uh, it's it's a, a, a widely used open source project, especially for uh, industry and production grade projects. Um, and uh, really the goal is, is to, to tell you more about it uh, so that, that you, know, you can decide uh, when we have to use it. I wonder what are those blue blue strips that are appearing on the screen? Is that Ursula Zoltan, do you know I mean, how that's happening? That would help if you can remove them. We may be attacked, yes. Uh, so if you can see if there's a way to, uh, you know, to undo that. I need to disable annotation. Let's see how we do that. Okay, let's see how that continues. Uh, so uh, Spark NLP is an, is an open source uh, project uh, for Python. Python is by far the most used. Um, uh, and then uh, also for Java and Scala. So we have complete full APIs for Java and Scala. Uh, in terms of what we focus on, the first and most important thing we focus on is accuracy. Uh, and the goal is to deliver uh, kind of really the best accuracy possible in a, in a production grade a trainable and scalable fashion. And then we also make sure uh, that uh, this kind of the best library that it can be in terms of scalability, uh, where you actually need to scale to uh, really to any Spark cluster, and also in terms of speed for training and for inference. We are having all kinds of issues today. Okay, um, so um, this is from last February, uh, although a, a more recent version was just released two weeks ago. Uh, one of the things that O'Reilly does once a year is that they have the, the very big AI adoption in the enterprise survey, uh, where they look not, not at research or academia, they look at practitioners, so people actually building production systems in, in, 
in, in industry. Uh, and in that, uh, Spark NLP is one of the most widely used libraries uh, overall, and by far the most widely used NLP library, kind of in enterprise settings. And this really, this really is where the library fits well. Um, if you're doing, you know, prototyping work or academic work, then, you know, there's a Spacey and there's a, a you know, Hugging Face and there's other like, you know, LNLMP, NLP Architect, there's some really good NLP libraries. Uh, but where, where Spark NLP really shines are kind of in the really kind of production grade enterprise settings. Uh, and that's uh, across the board. Uh, and as I said, the, the latest uh, survey from a couple of weeks ago is, uh, uh, you know, is uh, basically confirmed pretty much the same numbers. Uh, in terms of who is using the libraries, uh, so we, we don't know everyone because, you know, said it's completely open source, but from, from, you know, teams and companies who have contacted us and say, listen, we use this in production. Can we, you know, can, can we help you? Can you help us or contribute it back? As you can see, it's, you know, really all the major tech companies uh, many companies in the uh, finance industry. Um, so there's a lot of NLP in you know, finance, insurance, uh, you know, some in, in retail, uh, media, uh, and a lot of work in healthcare. Uh, Johnson Lab is a company focuses on, on healthcare and life science. Uh, so that's kind of uh, our vertical. Um, in terms of accuracy, uh, so, so one thing is, uh, you know, what do we mean when we say state of the art? So state of the art, you know, is, 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 is not a marketing BS term, it's an academic term, uh, which basically means the, the best accuracy on, on a, a kind of academic benchmarks that have been peer reviewed. So really the question is, okay, if you, if you confine yourself to kind of, you know, to peer reviewed kind of real papers that have been published and vetted, what's the best accuracy that basically that, you know, that the world knows to achieve? And, and uh, our goal is to be able to achieve that, but in a, in a, in a production setting, right? In a way that's also trainable and scalable. Uh, so the benchmark that you see on the right is on the, the classic EN Core a WebLG data set, or classic name and data recognition on micro average uh, F1 score. And I think both, both Spacey and Spark NLP have gone beyond that, uh, but we have actually updated numbers from last month and uh, definitely, you know, this is still the most accurate you can get. Um, the reason it's more accurate, it's really, it's, it's always a combination of things. Uh, but of course, everybody does deep learning. So really the question is, okay, what kind of models and what kind of architectures do you use, uh, right? Uh, the specific layers, how do you, you know, how do you actually implement the different layers, uh, right? From, you know, from loss functions to uh, the embeddings, uh, right? Uh, to, to really, you know, just how you tokenize. Um, uh, of course, which embeddings do you use? Like, do you use BERT? Do you use kind of better than BERT? Kind of, you know, the, the more like, you know, excellent and Albert and other uh, new types of embeddings which we use. Uh, and all of that is, is there within the library. Uh, other than the data, we really say accuracy is, is really all we think about. Uh, and and the, the cool thing about NLP is that it's a very fast moving field. Uh, so, you know, when, 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 when you have a new paper and you say you're state of the art, you usually stay there between eight to 10 weeks and then someone, you know, publishes something better. Uh, which means that really, uh, you know, we, we have to keep implementing and re-implementing new things to advance uh, with the state of the art. Uh, so just in the past like three months, uh, we've completely implemented the deep learning based document classification. Uh, we applied a new uh, contextual spell checker, uh, which actually beats like now state of the art academically. Uh, we've re-implemented our sentiment analyzer uh, to basically have a new deep learning architecture uh, and we've uh, uh, changed quite a few of our OCR algorithms uh, also to basically uh, to get in line or above what you know, kind of, you know, Google, Amazon now offer. Um, so that's uh, really the primary focus on the library, making sure, and, and we'll show you how, how you can use that. Uh, the second thing is, is scalability. And Spark NLP really, you know, per its name, is, is really intended uh, to be able to scale. Uh, obviously, most of, most of the use is, is on local machines, but it's really intended to use on Spark Cluster. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you can just basically, the, the NLP pipeline, and you'll see, we'll use the pipeline class in the example I'll show you, uh, is the same, is the uh, same uh, pipeline from, the, from Spark ML, so it's the exact same class, um, meaning that it's, it's by na natively, it's uh, distributable, it's uh, serializable, so you have good reproducibility, and of course, you can run it locally on a cluster. Um, and this really, if you need to scale beyond a single machine, this is pretty much your only option. Um, Another thing we do, we do a lot of work to scale kind of within one machine in terms of uh, threading, but I'll talk more about that uh, soon. Um, 
distributed computing is where we really take advantage of Spark, yeah, because what Spark does well is really tackle some of the really hard problems with distributed systems. Yeah, like how do you how do you minimize shuffling? How do you minimize bandwidth usage? Yeah, how do you optimize caching use, right? Especially on, on a single machine. Yeah, how do you optimize serialization, yeah, right? And we've done a lot of work with the Apache Spark community and with Databricks to make sure we really yeah, you know, profile and optimize the hell out of it. And we've been doing that for you know, three years now. Uh, uh, of course, you know, what you see here on the right is one example. And this also this is a public example. It's an O'Reilly blog post um, on, on inference. Uh, but, but of course, you know, you're not going to get you know, linear speed ups on every use case. Uh, you know, uh, the parallel computing is not magic. Uh, speed up depends on the use case, right? So, so if you're using, say, you know, a CNN, which is by nature more iterative, you're, you're going to get sublinear speed ups. If you're doing inference, you know, you, you, you should actually very normally you get near linear speed ups. Uh, in terms of speed, uh, so there's a, a really a lot of the work we do is really software engineering work to productize, um, uh, productize kind of the latest and greatest research. Um, uh, so for example, uh, uh, Sparkle, he comes with its own in-memory database based on RocksDB. Uh, so that we can quickly load embeddings, uh, we can cache them, we can share them across uh, different threads automatically, we can share them across pipeline stages. Uh, so, you know, and, and really in terms of both uh, uh, training and inference, uh, you're going to see a performance boost and really the more complex and big your uh, NLP task is, the, the bigger benefit you'll see. Uh, the other thing we do, uh, we have optimized builds uh, for basically the latest hardware platforms, uh, so both NV uh, Intel and NVIDIA. Um, this benchmark that you see on the right was done on AWS, was done last fall. And this was about training and name entity recognition specifically in French. Uh, so we want to see uh, basically what it takes to train a new name entity recognition model. And since the focus was on uh, speed, uh, we said, okay, let's, let's get to the same level of accuracy. And we tried this, uh, uh, what was available at the time, which is two uh, generations of the Intel chips. And, and one uh, and the GPU P100, which is you know, NVIDIA Tesla. In this specific test, uh, Intel actually out outperformed NVIDIA. Uh, so the Cascade Lake, which is the second gen Xeon, was 19% uh, faster and 46% cheaper, uh, which is a good testament to Intel. I mean, they've, they've done a lot of work, especially Cascade Lake has basically its own deep learning uh, set of instructions. It can use more memory than the, just the memory in the GPU. And Intel has done a lot of work on the software uh, on top of it. NVIDIA, of course, is not sitting quiet, and they've, they've generated, uh, I mean, just two weeks ago, uh, they launched a new A100, and there's a new set of chips there, and a new basic whole server around it, and we're working with them to optimize it as well, and that's our other commitment to the community. We'll make sure we optimize for the latest uh, kind of hardware and make sure we get those optimized builds out of the box. Uh, under that Spark NLP is, is uh, Apache 2 licensed, uh, both the, the code and the models. So uh, really, it kind of it's for you. Use it, abuse it, use it commercially, change whatever you want, don't tell us. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's very open uh, uh, in that sense and it's intended for commercial use. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's definitely production grade, uh, it's in use and uh, there's link here, there are links here, but uh, I'll also share some links in the end. Uh, you know, it's been actively used by, but you know, probably at this point, mo most of the kind of Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 in some capacity. Uh, definitely in kind of in, in production uh, use cases, some small, some very large. Um, we're fairly active with releases, and this is something you can just go on GitHub and see. Uh, we have 26 new releases in 2018, 30 new releases in 2019. Uh, I'm not sure how many we had this year, I think it's at least 10. Yeah, but we're continuing the same path of basically at least every two weeks we'll have a new release. Uh, and as you'll see, I mean, you can really just go on GitHub and read the releases yourself, but fairly, sub fairly substantial. Uh, so the last release, we added Excellent and Albert. We did the uh, a sentiment analyzer. Uh, we added the context-based uh, spell checker when we added more languages. Um, and now the library comes with pre-trained models for uh, 20 languages. Uh, there's also an active Slack community. So if you uh, start, and you have questions, you know, you're getting an out of memory error, or, you know, your hyperparameter tuning doesn't go, you know, the way you want, you, you can always, you know, just show the code and ask someone in Slack and people answer daily. So that's the overall library. Yeah, and I see we have a question there. Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer some questions as we go and some we'll, we'll save to, to the end. 
so in terms of what the library actually does, uh, and this is also this former blog post that was uh, published on Domino Data Labs, uh, but basically it's an end-to-end -end library. So it starts with really the basic of sentence detection, tokenization, stemming, lemmatization, part of speech, uh, and then goes all the way to uh, name native recognition, uh, sentiment uh, analysis, document classification, and, and yes, the question, yes, you can do topic modeling with it, definitely. Uh, but the goal is to have an end-to-end -end NLP library, and we keep adding more and more tasks uh, that it supports. Uh, for two reasons. First of all, it makes the API much simpler, right? You can have just basically an, one NLP pipeline does everything you need from the raw data to, to kind of really the, the outputs you care about. Um, the other thing is if you really want this to distribute and scale, either you know, across uh, threads or across machines, uh, then really it has to be the same library, right? Of course, it doesn't work if you have a you know, really a, you know, kind of highly scalable NER, but then really to do you know, tokenization and part of speech, to build the features, you have something that you know, only works on a single machine or vice versa. Uh, so we want to make sure from the beginning uh, it's 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 all optimized, uh, and and there's a number of uh, kind of underlying design optimizations there, right? So the the code, uh, if you're using Spark, the code runs on the JVM, uh, so you don't have to go back and forth to to Python, right? With UDFs and such, uh, we, it's, there are zero copies of the data frames that you use, um, uh, so so really kind of a lot of the overhead that you get. If you're trying to use uh, really, you know, like spacey transformers, you know, NLDK, uh, those libraries, uh, we do away with uh, just by by you know preventing serialization, interpose communication, uh, copying things in memory. Uh, so there's a question then: if we've done any work on uh, ill-form text or topic modeling? Uh, so first of all, basically all text is ill-form text. Uh, <laughs> there's no such thing as clean text. Maybe Wikipedia because they edit the hell out of it. Uh, but yes, definitely, we do a lot of work on training domain-specific models, and I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about that, how you train your own models, which is big. Uh, and yes, and topic modeling, uh, definitely uh, we've done, and there are public examples. I'll, I'll, I'll try to point to the, the notebooks that show that uh, as, as, you know, as we do that. Uh, there's another question of, have we worked on short or long documents? Uh, so also, I mean, when we get to the end, I'll show, I'll show some, some case studies. Uh, we've done both. So obviously, those work on like really short things, like you know, tweets or sentences or chat results. Uh, but then we also have case studies on uh, analyzing financial documents that are, you know, 200, uh, 100 pages long, uh, where you want to extract facts from them, uh, kind of do information extraction. Uh, so in terms of what comes out of the box, uh, right now, uh, there's about 100 pre-trained models and pipelines uh, that come with the library, uh, meaning it, it's basically, as you see, it's two or three lines of code uh, to use them. And the support for uh, 20 languages, mostly European ones, but we are working to expand it. Uh, one of the things, by the way, uh, you know, if you're interested, uh, we are definitely looking for more people to, uh, you know, to add models, add languages, add examples. Uh, and uh, you know, we'd, we'd be happy to work with people uh, kind of to do that and to help you kind of contribute and, and, and be, be part of that. Um, in terms of uh, supported runtimes, uh, so say Java, Python, and Scala are kind of official. Uh, so you know, it's, you can get the library from your know, PyPy or Conda, or you can get it from uh, you know Maven Central or Maven or, or SBT if you're on Java on Scala. You can get it from. Uh, of you know Spark from scratch, uh, and uh, and really uh, anywhere and everywhere in between. So can you hear me now? I think there's some. Yeah, I'm not sure where the issues are. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we'll continue. So that's the overall library. So it's an open source library for you and the community. Uh, to give you state of the art NLP, and now, uh, and that's the overview. So let's let's go about how we actually use it. Uh, so um, here's a simple example in Python for doing sentiment analysis. And uh, uh, the goal, as you know, is with every library, is what can you do with five lines of code? Uh, so you know that's what we're trying to do here. So import Spark NLP, Spark NLP dot start. Uh, you initialize the library. Uh, you import a pre-trained pipeline. And so pre-trained pipeline basically is a complete pre-trained uh, you know, set of, of models and tasks that come together. So here we do pipeline equals pre-trained pipeline, analyze sentiment ML in English, EN means English. 
Uh, and then we annotate Harry Potter is a great movie. Uh, what you get is a result, which is, which is a simple Python dictionary. And if you print result sentiment, it will print positive. So that's it. That's all you need to know to, to actually do sentiment analysis and if you're using pre-trained models. And we'll go later about what you do if you want to train your own. Uh, here's another example. Uh, so this is named entity recognition. So name entity recognition is a very popular task in NLP. Uh, well, what you want is you want to give it a string, like Chandler and Monica met in Central Park, and you want it to recognize entities. And uh, in this example, the kind of entities we care about are, are person and location. Uh, but you know, depending on use case, your use case, maybe you're trying to say, oh no, I care about uh, you know, I care about diagnosing, uh, you know, diagnosis, medical diagnosis, and drugs and medical procedures, or I care about names of uh, genes, right? If I'm if I'm doing kind of uh, you know biomedical thing. Or if I'm in the finance space, I care about you know names of companies and names of you know products, names of executives. Uh, so you want to be able to train your NER for the specific kind of entities you care about. A, a good NER uh, would have some uh, would have some understanding of language and context. Okay, uh, specifically, it would do much better than dictionary. Okay, so for example, here uh, Chandler and Monica, uh, we should know they are both people, uh, and Chandler is not, for example, the city of Chandler, Arizona. Okay, because the city and a person don't meet, that just doesn't make sense. Okay, uh, the other thing, Central Park is, uh, you know, it's of course a fictional place, right? So it will not exist in any dictionary, right? But, uh, you know, that's a coffee shop where they met in France. Uh, but most importantly, in English, when you say someone and someone met in, after met in, you will only have a place or a time. Okay, and this is not a time. Uh, this, you know, seems much more like a place. It's also capitalized, so a model should know that this is a place. So you'd expect your model to learn those those things, and and here's how would you know um, um, and and right now, uh, you know kind of the, the state of the art architecture, uh, although you know, is is with embeddings you can probably do slightly better than BERT, but let's say you come and say look I want three lines of code, I want to apply state of the art NER with BERT, pipeline equals pre-trained pipeline recognize entities BERT in English, result equals pipeline dot annotate Harry Potter is a great movie, and uh, you ask for the NER. A, a column of the a, of your result dictionary, and it would a, identify a, within Harry Potter. Basically, would identify that Harry Potter is a person, right? If you see the first two tokens, which are Harry and Potter, it would identify they are part of a person. Okay, which is what you're looking for here. Okay, so this will be all you need a, to get this done. Here's another example, and this example is in Scala. A, really, just to show you, the Scala API is, is super similar and also super easy to use. Uh, and what you're doing here, this is something pretty unique to Spark NLP, which is spell checking and spell correction, uh, which is also trainable. <coughs> uh, so pipeline equals pre-train pipeline, spell check ML in English. Harry Potter uh, is a great movie. As you can see, the words uh, great and movie uh, are misspelled. And when you look at the results, the spell column, uh, you get the results by token, and you can see that great and movie have been corrected. Okay, and, and by the way, that's one of the uh, things that uh, in last week's release that we have uh, uh, greatly improved. Uh, last week, we, we uh, launched the context-based spell checker. Uh, so the context spell checker uh, is able to correct, uh, basically, it would, it would look at the same, uh, same error, okay, but correct it based on the context. Okay, so for example, it can identify things like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the word is technically correct, but it should be in plural. Right, so it would be able to do that based on the context of a sentence. Okay, uh, so that's a pretty cool thing that uh, really out of the box, three, line, three lines of code is still there. Uh, so let's look at some uh, notebooks because we like looking at code. Um, all of the notebooks, first of all, this is really important. These are all public notebooks, everything I'm showing you now. Um, they are, <coughs> if you go to a uh, GitHub, John Snow Lab slash Spark NLP workshop. On the workshop, we have all of the public notebooks. Uh, we keep them up to date. Okay, so they work. Uh, another nice thing, uh, we have now Colab notebooks. Uh, Colab notebooks has the beautiful feature where, you know, if you want, you can just run them on Colab so you can actually see them running within your own uh, Google environment. Okay, uh, so without installing anything, you know, you can try them, uh, you know, within your own environment. I just want to make sure. Uh, can you see the screen when I go to the notebooks? Does this can still show okay? Okay, great, thank you. So, um, installation, and this is really just a copy paste. If you run this on Colab, it would install what it needs. But basically, it's pretty simple. 
you need to install, uh, you install, you pip install PySpark, and then you pip install Spark NLP, right? And that's that's that uh, for Python. Uh, you load the libraries, uh, you start it, uh, you just, you know, we just check that it starts and the versions are correct. And then let's see how we use NER. Uh, so here's an example, uh, pipeline equals, pipeline.annotate, explain document DL. He would love to visit many beautiful cities with you and lives in an amazing country like Germany or Pakistan. Okay, result equals pipeline.annotate and you can see the result. So the result uh, has different keys. Uh, so this is everything that we analyzed. We got entities, we got stem, we got uh, ch spell checked, we got lemmas, we got part of speech, we got tokens, there's a number, you know, we have the actual embeddings. And right, sometimes people just want to use this for embeddings, right? The same way people use, you know, hugging face, oh, look, I just give me the embeddings and I'll, I'll take it from here, which is fine. Uh, and here you can see what happens, uh, you can see what you get. Uh, so for example, uh, one thing you get is really just the sentence column is really just splitting into two sentences. Okay, and in this case, splitting into sentences is, is trivially easy because we have punctuation. Uh, uh, but, but for example, uh, uh, in Spark MP, it has two sentence splitting algorithms. One of them is simple, it's, my, you know, it's kind of regex based. Uh, but the other one is a, a deep sentence detector. And if, for example, uh, you use a speech to text, okay, then the challenge is you have no punctuation, right? Then it becomes a much harder problem to split things into sentences. And then you actually need a deep learning model to do that really well. Uh, so that comes with the library. Uh, or sometimes you use OCR. Uh, also, uh, OCR tends to miss some punctuation. Uh, and then also having a, a sentence detector that actually understands the language and split sentences that way uh, is much better. Uh, the next thing we have here is a uh, lemmatization. Uh, so a, a, a lemmatization <coughs> basically refers to uh, giving you the lemma, the lemma of a word. Uh, the lemma, is basically it's a dictionary definition uh, of the word. So for example, if you, if you have lives, the word lives, a dilemma is life, okay? Because that's, that's the lemma, that's how we see this word in the dictionary. Other things that, you know, love and beautiful and uh, city, well, city actually, I think, yeah. City was plural, we, we got it back to um, singular, okay? Another thing we have is we have some spell correction here. And if you paid attention, you'd see that we have some couple of spelling mistakes here. So beautiful is misspelled. Uh, with is misspelled. Okay, and let's see if you actually got it. Uh, yeah, in, uh, you got beautiful. Let's see. With it, it did not get. Okay, uh, because that's probably a harder one. Kind of, and, and this is kind of what automated spell checkers can do, right? So if you see this word, right, it, you, you really would know kind of, and, and the algorithm is based on the statistically, right? Uh, so algorithm can know, look, it's far more likely that the word is beautiful. Uh, when it's see something like this, it's less certain. So in this case, it did not correct it. Uh, the other thing we get are parts of speech. Okay, so he is a proper a proper noun. Visit is a verb. Um, uh, these are uh, adjectives, right? Uh, many and beautiful. You is a proper noun. Lives is a um, plural verb, I believe. Okay, uh, country is a noun. Okay, so we have the uh, parts of speech. Okay, and these are kind of just some of the examples here. Okay, uh, another thing to look at is another example. So this also goes collab, goes from the installation and looks at the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is a 16th century old painting created by Leonardo. It's held the Louvre in Paris. And, and let's see what we have here. Oh, the main thing yeah, we were looking for uh, and how we get the actual entities. Right, so here the entities are Mona Lisa, Leonardo, it's for whatever it's will recognize, the Louvre and Paris. So we have one mistake here. Uh, the other thing we have is uh, we can look at the any R column and then we can see it by token. So you can see here are the tokens and that's useful if you have multi-token entities. We have Leonardo, it's, is for the, it's an organization, I wonder why. And then we have the Louvre and Paris, which are locations. Okay, is another example. Uh, you can see kind of just more, you know, just different text, right? We can identify people, identify organizations, and so on. Okay, so this is kind of out of the box. Um, ah, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, we'll get to that question towards the end. Okay. Oh, I'll want to go back to the slides here and talk about a few, uh, go through a few other things. But don't worry, we'll get back to notebook soon. 
Okay, so uh, a bit about what happens under the hood when when you do you know you do this kind you you activate these kind of pre-trained models. Uh, so first, when you call start, uh, it does spark in you. Uh, it does. I mean, you do use Apache Spark in the background, uh, but as you've seen, if you do not want to uh, work with Spark, if you do not know Spark, you really do not have to. Uh, so we've done a lot of work so that Spark is completely hidden. Uh, what I would say, if you if you like Spark and if you want to, you know, to have uh, uh, to work directly with data frames or configure the Spark sessions, you can do that as well. Um, Pre-trained pipeline uh, loads. Uh, you know, this is an example around the explained document model. Uh, it loads the different uh, models and embeddings. So basically it can load them uh, either from disk or from the network. Uh, so uh, by default, if things are already in memory, that's great. If not, they are loaded from disk. If they're not available locally, try to load them from S3. And basically get those pre-trained models uh, for you, kind of it's a completely fresh machine. As I mentioned, there's, there's a whole caching systems and local storage. Uh, then if we have deep learning components, which we usually do, we initialize TensorFlow in the same JVM process, which was a whole engineering project by itself, uh, but uh, uh, definitely worthwhile in terms of the speed gains and the memory gains here. Uh, we uh, load, uh, initialize it with the pre-trained embeddings like BERT, right, and the models, uh, kind of the actual uh, network architectures. Um, when, once you've done that and you call annotate, uh, basically you say, okay, do inference. Okay, so we, we call the actual algorithm of each stage. Uh, uh, stages that require deep learning, kind of, they, they call to TensorFlow below the, kind of under the hood, uh, right, which activate kind of the right kind of network architecture. Uh, embeddings are used as part of it, right, so are just calculated as we need them. Uh, and then as a result, you get a result, which is a plain local Python dictionary. Okay, so the main point of this slide is show, look, all of this happens for you. You do not really have to be aware, aware of it. Okay, of course, unless you're building the library, you're improving it, but if you really just want to get stuff done, usually it's a few lines of code and you're good to go. Okay, so now uh, the four key concepts you need to understand when you work with the library. Uh, one of them is the concept of a pipeline. Uh, so a pipeline is basically just a list of processing steps. Um, <coughs> uh, so uh, for example, we take initial text, we turn it into a document, uh, so document assembly takes in text, outputs a document. Uh, you've seen the sentence detector, the sentence detector takes a document and you saw outputs a list of sentences. In the pipeline we've seen it, there were two sentences. A tokenizer takes sentences and produces a list of tokens. And then for example, if you want a sentiment analyzer, a sentiment analyzer would usually work, you know, it can work for example at the token level. It can also work at the, at the sentence level. In this example, it's on tokens. So this in general, how an NLP pipeline works. Uh, in Spark NLP, a pipeline is the main way you kind of, you configure what you want to do, right? So you can come and say, oh, uh, take this text. Yeah, I don't care about sentences because this is short, just do tokenization and then do some spell checking and then, you know, uh, do these kind of embeddings and send it to NER, right? So you configure the pipelines. All the pipelines you've seen so far were, you know, pre-trained, kind of out of the box pre-built pipelines, but it's all, it's super configurable. Uh, the next key concept is an annotator. Uh, so an annotator is one step in a pipeline. Uh, so for example, a, a sentiment detector is an annotator, right? So it will be one of those uh, boxes when you have your pipeline. And as you see, when you configure it, uh, you can configure the input columns, right? So, so in this case, sentiment detector would work in sen on sentences because you can say, look, I care about sentiment at the sentence level, right? You can also ask for it to be at the document level or at the token level. And you say, here's the, the output. Uh, you know, uh, the output, who the output and sentiment score, right? And as you saw in the notebooks, I can put outputs, you know, NER or entities or lemma or check or whatever I call my output. And then say dictionary, for example, but basically means you, you can configure it, right? And you'll configure the annotator object uh, however you need. And the annotator classes basically have the implementations of the, the algorithms. Uh, the next concept is a resource. A, a resource is basically any external file that an annotator needs to run, right? Like for example, pre-trained models, embeddings, uh, transformers, rules, uh, whole pipelines, dictionaries, uh, whatever may be the case. Uh, and Spark NLP, as we say, you know, kind of centrally manages and shares and optimizes and caches uh, resources, right? So there's this whole uh, resource management concept within the library. Uh, and then uh, the last concept is a pre-trained pipeline, which really just puts it all together. Uh, so pre-trained pipeline, is a pre-built pipeline uh, that includes a set of uh, annotators, a set of resources within them. 
right? So that when you, when you call uh, load the pre-trained pipeline, explain document DL, basically you tell it, okay, load the pipeline, uh, load all the models, load all the embeddings, initialize everything, uh, so that when I call annotate, I can just, you know, you, you can just, you know, kind of do your thing. A, a pipeline has a, three important methods. Two of them you see here, which are annotate and transform. A, annotate works on a single string, transform works on a Spark data frame. Okay, uh, and that's really the only difference between running something locally and or really kind of using a, you know, scaling to a cluster. Uh, the third important method of a pipeline is fit, which is used to do training. Okay, and that's another important feature, uh, which is all of the pipelines are trainable. Okay, and that's, for example, how we support new languages, how we support domain-specific use cases, and really in most uh, real industry NLP uh, projects, you will need to train your own models. Uh, because language tends to be uh, super domain specific. So uh, let's see how we actually put all of these together and actually train our own NER model. So uh, we do import, we do we initialize, we do Spark equals Spark and the start. We load the training data. Okay, and MNIT recognition training data is in the CONLL 2003 format. So basically, it's a CSV file with a, with, with a, a row per token. Then we say, is this token you know, is it an I pair or I lock for location or, or, or for nothing? Uh, and this pipeline is going to be pretty simple. Uh, we're going to say, take your, you know, take the input, calculate built embeddings. So we, we load, uh, we, we initiate the built embeddings uh, resource as an annotator. So we say built equals built embedding dot pre trained, built base case in English. And we say this annotator would uh, take each sentence. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, it would, so BERT, what it does it would uh, create an embedding for each token, okay? And the output would be in the BERT column, okay? However, BERT embeddings takes two input columns, sentence and token, uh, because if you're familiar with BERT, you know that it calculates embeddings in the context of a sentence. So basically we say you calculate embeddings per token, but the context is, is your sentence. And, and for that, by the way, you'll get much better results if you actually have a good sentence detector. Yeah, right, because if you just give Bert and tell it, oh, just you know, five words on each side, you're going, you know, you're going to go across sentences and get much worse uh, context to work with. And then we load after we calculate the embeddings, we say, okay, let's let's load the NER tagger, the actual name and recognition algorithm. Uh, so we say uh, it has two input, uh, three inputs, uh, three inputs: sentence, token, and Bert. Uh, sentence is the the context. Token is is really what you want to uh, you want to get. Uh, to annotate each token, right, to see if the, it's part of, a, a, of an entity, and BERT is are your embeddings, your two labels. Uh, and so when you have your two columns, you have the label columns, which is for training, you have the output, which is NER. Uh, then we define a pipeline uh, with those two stages. So basically we say we only have two stages, just calculate the BERT embeddings and then run the NER tagger, and we call fit on the training data. Okay, and this is all you need uh, to calculate, to, uh, to train your own built based uh, name entity recognizer. Okay, um, including everything kind of state of the art network, uh, optimized for Intel, optimized for NVIDIA, scales to a cluster, uh, you know, serializable so you can reproduce it. Uh, that's the entire code that you need to do that. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, let's, uh, so there's a notebook here. I don't know, I'm just looking at the time. I don't think we'll go through all of it, but what I would want to show, sorry, I'm clicking at this. Again, I need to find a way to convince. Let's explain documents. Uh, so there's an notebook here, and there's also it's it's in this within the same folder, uh, which takes you through the training process. And there are many many environments here. Uh, there are many uh, uh, different details here. Uh, so for example, this is how the core NL, this is how the training data looks like. So you can see the training data format. You can see how you can configure your own Spark session if you really want to do that to allocate more or less memory, different threading, uh, assign to GPUs, uh, all of those pieces. And then the other thing this does here, uh, it shows you the different way you can customize the training. So you can set epochs, you can set random seed, you can set validation split, uh, you can set, you know, uh, what, what kind of logging do you want? Uh, do you want confidence values uh, from, from the NER results, yes or no? 
uh, and then it runs the training. Uh, the other thing it does, it shows you how you can use them in different contexts. Uh, so how you can evaluate results. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, and then how you can uh, run an inference pipeline. Okay, so once you have the pre-trained model, how do you, how, and, and how do you build the pipeline? You see it's all the same thing. You have annotate also document sentence, token, BERT. Uh, you unload the NER model, which you load and converter, and you put them in uh, pipeline stages. And then you can, yeah, you, you call fit to train and you call transform to actually do inference. Um, and so really, once you know those basics, it, it's all uh, kind of, it's all the same. And then really just shows multiple examples of doing that. Um, so I think really, uh, I mean, if really, if you want to do it yourself, I guess my main message is, is you have notebooks that they can run on Colab. Yes, yeah, so you can just, you know, without an installation, you can just give it a go and see how it works for you. Um, you know, and see, uh, you know, and, and, and from there you, 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 you can, uh, you know, just go and build your own projects. And um, one more thing to show, uh, the concept of a light pipeline. Uh, a light pipeline is another major optimization we have. Um, a light pipeline, uh, basically, as you can see, it just wraps a pipeline. So once we have a pipeline, you can wrap it in a light pipeline. Once you wrap it in a pi light pipeline, it's still a pipeline, so you can do the same thing. You can do annotate or you can do transform. Right, so Peter pa pa Parker is a nice man who lives in New York, and we recognize that Peter Parker is a person and New York is a location. Uh, however, light pipelines do not create a Spark task uh, for every inference, okay, uh, which uh, can save you, you know, which save quite a few milliseconds. Uh, I, thank you, and thank you for sharing the, sharing the link. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, so, uh, for example, if what you need to do for inference is you need to have a REST API uh, and, uh, uh, and people kind of just send a document and the REST API process that one document and returns a call, right? Then really what you, op you, what you want, what you optimize your inference for is for um, a kind of single documents, right? So it's not 50,000 documents or 500,000 documents or you need to run it over a cluster. You can say, look, this is a local thing. I, I, I process documents one by one. For that, you really want to use light pipeline because um, the light pipeline uh, would enable you basically to get from, you know, like 500 milli milliseconds to more like, you know, 20, 30 milliseconds for a pipeline. Okay. Um, okay. What I'd like to do now, given the time, I'd like to talk about some other things that are available now and then answer some questions uh, with, the, with the 10 minutes we have. Uh, so uh, what else is there? Um, so, uh, in terms of models and languages, you go to uh, github.com slash Johnson Labs slash Spark NLP models. Uh, you can see the list of models and pipelines that are uh, available. Okay, and we can we keep it updated. And then uh, you can see the languages that are supported. Okay, hey, Hungarian is actually on the list now. That's cool. Um, Okay, and, and of course, you know, if you go to Portuguese, you can see the Portuguese, we have a, a lemmatizer, we have a part of speech detector, and we have three name native recognizers. Okay, same thing for Russian. Okay, and that's kind of our core, our core language support, which is, yeah, we can tokenize, we can lemmatize, we can do part of speech, we can do name entity recognition, uh, and, and kind of, you know, on, on you know, at, at high accuracy. Um, uh, so there are 20 languages, uh, we are um, definitely looking to expand this. Okay, uh, if, you are if you need more languages, if you need more pipelines, uh, we also get open requests for things that are, it's not other languages, but specific domains. So finance, uh, legal, uh, we, we're also looking to expand either. Uh, and those are, those are free and open. Uh, there are two commercial expansions. And uh, one of them is Spark NLP for healthcare, which is specifically for the medical domain. And one is Spark OCR for OCR. Uh, we're not going to talk about them, but you know, obviously, if you're interested, company would, would love to talk to you about them. Um, there are quite a few, and I can I can share this slide uh, afterwards. Uh, all of these are links. I mean, they're not marketing case studies; they're actual technical talks that we had. Uh, uh, so Spangly was you know presented you know like you know O'Reilly AI conferences, and uh, uh, you know this month we're talking at Spark Plus AI Summit, uh, ODSC, uh, Strata Data, right? And and uh, you know actually we, we teach the deep learning and NLP tutorials in all these conferences. Uh, 
so what would be interesting here is that these are all technical talks. Uh, so we have a business use case, uh, but then it dives into the uh, uh, the actual uh, code, right? And sometimes accuracy numbers. And especially if you're doing industry production software, there's some good lessons learned in each one. What worked, what didn't, what was hard. Uh, so this is really where I recommend you start. Uh, and then, uh, you know, these are kind of the key links to start with. And then I'll, I'll just go on and answer some of the questions people had. Uh, but basically, if you want to start, start with nlp.johnsonlabs.com because it links to everything else. It links to the public notebooks, it links to the Slack channel, it links to installation instructions. Uh, the repo is here, so, you know, welcome to start it, fork it, you know, contribute back, do whatever you need. And uh, of course, we want people to use it, you know, succeed with it. If you want to contribute back or if you want to do an internship or, you know, capstone project or anything, you know, we're open to that as well. Please let us know. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's what I want to cover. I'll, uh, with the time we have, I'll answer some of the questions I see here. Um, so there's one question about uh, how we can we uh, uh, retrain some of the pre-trained models, like adding custom stop words. Uh, so first of all, there is a stop word removal annotator. That's one of the features. Uh, one of the things it accepts, you can configure it with your own stop word uh, dictionary. Uh, so if you're working, for example, in you know, Korean and you have your own stop words, you can definitely do that. Um, and then uh, you, you may not even have to retrain the downstream models. You just have to replace the stop word annotator. Uh, but in a sense, really, everything is trainable. As you see, you know, the tokenizer is trainable. Sentence detector is, is, a, is a trainable model. Part of speech is model-based and trainable. Of course, any other sentiment analysis, spell checking, a, a document classification are all trainable. A, one of the, a, really one of the main advantages a, a, of Spark UP is how easy, how easy it is to train your own models. A, because that's really one of the differences we see between kind of, you know, academic and, and industry projects. In industry, really almost every project you need to train your own to get good accuracy. A, so that's, that's definitely there. A, the question about comparison to NLTK. A, and how, how does Spark NLP compared to an NER compared to, uh, compared to LNTK? Uh, look, the short answer is it's, it's more accurate. Uh, but the longer answer is, look, in general, look, uh, deep learning happened to NLP three, four years ago, uh, which means that, that you know, pretty much overnight, uh, all of the libraries that we know and love, like you know, NLTK and Spacey and Stanford and OpenNLP uh, became significantly outdated in terms of accuracy. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, and, and Spark NLP is one of the first libraries to implement that. Uh, so that's what, what you should expect. But I would say, of course, it depends on your use case. So look, these are all free open source. Just allow them and try it yourself and see what you get on your data set. It would be interesting to see the output. Um, let's see. I'm trying to figure out other questions. Uh, but, uh, oh, there's one more question. Uh, where does the name Jon Snow let's come from? So yes, it definitely comes from the 1854 cholera epidemic. Uh, so Dr. Jon Snow was a physician in Victorian London um, and, uh, and most famous for stopping a cholera outbreak uh, but by actually analyzing data. Uh, what he did uh, with others, he built a map of all the people who died and discovered that it was a specific water well that was most likely causing the, uh, uh, causing the, the, the problem the infection and the, the, the water pipe was uh, disabled. And after a short while, the, the uh, epidemic uh, stopped. And that was, uh, that's really one of the, the first great example of using data to improve public health, uh, hence the inspiration yeah, behind the, the company name. Yes. Uh, so let's see, I can see a few other questions, but I know we're out of time. So Ursula, I mean, if you want to take over, uh, please do. And, and the, uh, what I would say is, look, here are my details. Uh, please, any questions I have not answered, uh, please, you know, email me, send me messages. Send them. Uh, I'll be happy to help. Okay, thank you, David, very much. I think this was a wonderful talk, and uh, I see that uh, we have uh, many questions. And if you are all agree, we still have some time for these questions because we are here for, for getting to know much more about uh, this topic. So I think we can go on. Uh, if you are all agree, we, we can raise this or we can have these questions. Uh, so for example, we uh, have this question, what is the state of the art in the non-open source space? Um, 
So uh, here's what I know. Look, so first of all, you cannot really tell, right? Because by definition, if someone is working in you know, the secret laboratory and they don't release any benchmarks or comparison, you do not really know. Uh, I would say it's extremely unlikely uh, that there are not open source packages that do significantly better than, than the, what the scientific community does, uh, given that the main players, like, you know, the Google, Facebook, Microsoft, you know, keep keep fighting and, and you know, who can publish, you know, for free the, the best models. And of course, the, lar the larger academic institutions are doing the same. Um, when we compete, uh, what we do know, right, is we, you know, we, we compete, of course, you know, I'd say at least once or twice a quarter in kind of the bake-off, right, with large companies that, you know, would do these accuracy bake-offs. Uh, so, you know, the reason I know we do state of doubt because like we haven't lost in like two years. Um, uh, so I know we do well in that sense. Um, I think that there are two things you need to look for. Uh, one is um, really kind of, you know, when, when the tool was built and what techniques does it use? Uh, because there's been a huge difference just in the past two years, right? With what you can do with transfer learning. Um, and uh, you want to work with software that actually takes advantage of that. That's one thing. The other really important thing is to make sure that models are trainable to the use case. Um, because what happens very often is that someone says, oh, I train my thing on all of Wikipedia or all on common crawl, right? But it doesn't really work for you because you're trying to process kind of, you know, SEC filings, right? Or, or patent applications or customer support emails. And, and the thing with languages is that almost for every, every domain or every type of document you look at, it has its own vocabulary. It has its own grammar. It has its own semantics, kind of things that go unsaid but are assumed. Uh, so really, uh, I think I'm, I'm yet to see kind of a real sizable industry project did not require training your own custom models. Uh, so I think if, if you're evaluating things and for your own project, your own company, uh, the best thing you can do is take a data set that you trust, kind of take, I don't know, a thousand documents that you think is reasonably, reasonably represents your challenge and actually try, try to see what you take to, you know, train a model or do transfer learning from an existing model and see what results you get. Uh, because that, that's really where you get the best accuracy. And I know that for us, really, the, 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 you know, one of the things we've seen, it's really more about uh, how fast can you train a model uh, to really match a specific use case. Uh, and I would say with, with some of the transfer learning improvements of the past two years, uh, you can do that really, um, uh, really like, you know, you can do what, what you can do today with 500 documents, uh, you know, would we'll take like 20,000 documents even, even three years ago. Uh, so, so it becomes much easier and faster to do. Okay, thank you very much. Now we are getting so many questions that we, we need uh, to select some of them. Uh, maybe the most important one is that uh, is, is about the slides. So do you agree, David, that we can share the slides with the audience? Because if you do so, then we can share all the slides in uh, our website. I mean, uh, the website of the Hungarian Natural Language Processing Meetup. Uh, definitely, yes. I will email you the slides and you're welcome to post Okay, them. okay. So everyone can see the slides uh, on our website under the event. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, okay. Uh, let's see again uh, some of the questions uh, because we are running out of time. Uh, Spark was singled out as a good tool for synthetic data generation. Could you elaborate on its uh, capability in this respect, David? Uh, well, I'm not sure how to answer that one because uh, synthetic data generation, it's also, it's a very domain specific thing, right? So, so being able to automatically generate Reddit posts is really different than being able to automatically generate, you know, academic abstracts and super different than generating, uh, you know, radiology reports, right? In a medical setting. Uh, Right? Because, for example, if you do try to do radiology reports, yes, you need to understand the language and the, the terms and the type of grammar. Uh, but you also want to do things like, oh, make sure that, you know, if you have 5,000 patients, there's a good distribution, right, between types of cancer and, you know, ages and genders, right? And if you're in an academic setting and say you're doing whatever, computational biology, uh, you want to actually have a, you know, decent coverage of the vocabulary, right? So you want different coverage of the kind of terms people use in different sub, sub, you know, subfields there. Um, so let's say at the end of the day, I mean, if you really want, uh, you know, to have a good synthetic data set, 
Like you need to understand a specific domain you're, you're looking for, right? It's never about just generating text. Okay, thank you again. And maybe the last question uh, for uh, today. Uh, do you check your models uh, versus SAS? Uh, this is one of the largest uh, SWU uh, co uh, companies, sorry, in analytics. So can you, or do you check your models versus SAS? That's the question. So, so yes, yeah, and I see a similar question about Spacey, right? So. Uh, so say, look, what we what we know, what we regularly test against. So yes, we we uh, test against uh, uh, Spacey. We test against Stanford. Uh, we test against SAS. Uh, we test against the uh, uh, the AWS and Google uh, online services. Uh, we don't test against the Azure one. I mean, I have nothing against them. We just haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, I know they're good too. Um, and I would say in the healthcare setting where we have kind of our own specific models, I mean, there are kind of the healthcare specific competitors in that space, uh, open source and commercial. Uh, uh, so yes, definitely, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I think if there's a, a specific, I mean, the question about Spacey, I think uh, we can share, I think it's even on the, on the website, uh, if I remember correctly. If you go to nlp.johnsonlabs.com. Okay, now this one. Yeah, here you see benchmarks. You have Spacey, Clear, NLP, Core, Made. These are only open source ones. Um, yeah, and Spacey definitely has deep learning models, although I would say they have a lot of work there uh, to actually improve them, and which I think they're doing. I mean, I, I'm Spacey, I mean, they, they, it's a great community. Uh, just the focus has not really been on the, on the deep learning space, uh, but I'm, I'm sure they'll get there. Um, yeah, SAS as well, yes. We, we definitely test uh, against SAS. Uh, and look, there's you know there, there, there's several other good companies and, and you know good package in this space, and you should definitely you know evaluate and see what works best for your project. 